Welcome to High Noon, the podcast where we have smart conversations with interesting people or interesting conversations with smart people. I don't know which is the proper tagline. I'm Emily Jashinsky, obviously filling in for the one and only, the great Inez Stepman, who is cavorting about Europe uh, this week as we record this podcast. It is my pleasure and my honor truly to be here filling in for Inez on High Noon. I am joined today by someone I think of as equally brilliant uh, as Inez. That would be Maddie Kearns from National Review. Maddie, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of High Noon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Now, Maddie, congratulations are in order. Um, it is yeah. now, I believe, public <laughs> that you are engaged. You were betrothed uh, what to, within the last two days, three days? Yeah. So I was in New York with my boyfriend, now fiancé. And uh, yeah, he popped the question at our favorite church in Manhattan. And Ed was making fun of me that this is the most Catholic proposal she's ever heard of. It was, <laughs> sure she was after after mass went over to a little shrine of saint joseph and uh and he asked me there so it's really nice really sweet what a, what a beautiful story i love yeah. that and Thank a you. beautiful weekend i'm sure june in new york city oh yes yeah very hot sunny wonderful weekend just before the city starts to smell of garbage no, it, it smelled of garbage. It did. Oh, okay, good. I feel like it's usually it July, smells, August, yeah. but maybe it just gets worse in July. Worse in July and August. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, this is not a podcast about garbage smells or personal news. Uh, no, <laughs> as I mean, much it, as it we could, could we could keep going, Maddie. Right? <laughs> uh, that would be uh, that would be fun, actually. But we we do have big news to talk about. Um, in fact, even bigger news. <laughs> And your engagement, Maddie, which was on Friday, uh, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade in the Dobbs versus Mississippi ruling um, that the the justices handed down. Nobody knew the entire city here in Washington, D.C. was tense for weeks. Reporters uh, getting to the Supreme Court early, protesters getting to the Supreme Court early, always ready to be prepared uh, to demonstrate and to capture those demonstrations whenever the judgment was rendered. And we now have it. The leak uh, as anticipated, or the leak, I should say, had us all in anticipation that Roe would be overturned. It seemed that that was the case. It seemed that that would be the case, and indeed it was. Uh, the The final ruling doesn't seem to be all that different from the leaked ruling that was written by Justice Alito. And IWF, uh, where Maddie and I are both fellows, um, so this is a truly uh, an IWF production in, in uh, every way. <laughs> uh, the, the great IWF does not take a position on abortion. What we're going to do, um, I think, is get into some of the, the interesting details about how this will unfold politically and practically um, over the next I'm going to say the next decade, because the next days, the next week, I mean, this had an immediate impact um, on the country, on the laws in the country. There were trigger laws already on the books in some states and in both directions, laws that codified Roe and laws that basically banned abortion um, in most cases immediately. So the country has, has already changed dramatically and did the moment that judgment came out basically. And uh, that's not going to stop this debate, Maddie. Um, and so I have a lot of thoughts about where I think this is going to go. This debate is going to go in the coming days, weeks, months, years, and decades. But I want to start by asking you, uh, what is on the proverbial political table in these State, let's say state legislatures in Congress where Democrats are, are surely going to try to codify Roe with some piece of legislation. What do you see, at least uh, in terms of policy, where do you see this debate heading right now? So I think right now it's going to be the Democrats making the most of this for the midterms. They want to get away from inflation. They want to get away from rising gasoline prices. I mean, this is what Biden made clear in his address, right? He was saying this is going to be on the ballot come November. They want it on the ballot because it's a distraction. And the way it's been framed, obviously, is that this is Republicans taking away a constitutional right uh, in an unprecedented way. This is what Biden said. So I think they're really going to hammer that home. And, and they're certainly going to get amplification of that in the liberal media, most of our institutions. That's actually kind of the remarkable thing about the overturning of Roe is like most cultural institutions in America are very much on the, the pro-choice side, have been since Roe was passed in the first place 
And so it's kind of this incredible revolution, really, to have this. And there, there's lots, lots of reasons why it happened. And, and certainly Trumpism is, is one expression of it. It was interesting to see, I thought, Biden credited Trump for the overturning of Roe and Trump <laughs> in a really rare moment of like I don't know what he credited God so it's like I don't I don't know what's going on here this is so, something just insane in our politics mm. that that these are these are the characters that, that have brought around this this thing that like a significant portion of Americans have been fighting for for a long time but in terms of this so I, I basically see it as the midterms it's going to be the Democrats scrambling to to really just use this to their advantage and I think they will have uh, they will find that to be effective in, in some ways. I think that um, people do care about this issue. I'll caveat that with it doesn't seem that people care about it as much as they make out that they care about it. So I think it was recent, uh, it might have been a USA Today poll showed that like this isn't the most important issue, certainly by a long shot. This is not something... Um, that people would necessarily necessarily consider a voting priority one way or another. I think a good test of that as well was um, Glenn Youngkin's victory, mm. where you saw like in in Democrat uh, Democrat places, you're you're going to find that they're already going to have abortion. They're going to have legal abortion. It's going to be protected. Um, so it's not really this pressing issue for them. Whereas in the way it's it's presented. In the, in the coastal elites, it's much more, you know, this is this is something that's got this question of urgency. So that's the, the Democrats, you know, they will try and use it. We'll see how that goes. Um, more interesting question, I'd be very interested in your thoughts on this, is like, what do Republicans do now? Because obviously we're going to see a bit of uh, sorting of the sheep from the, the wolves here in terms of who has really been a, a convinced pro-lifer and who has been saying what needs to be said to get the pro-life um, contingent to vote for them as, as a Republican. And that's going to be very interesting. And it's going to, I think it's going to be very interesting to see the parochialism in America, how it's going to play out differently. Like some states are going to go more incremental. I mean, it's interesting that the, the Mississippi law at, at, that in Dobbs is 15 weeks, right? So that's not, that's not a heartbeat bill, right? That's in line with most of Europe. So I don't know. What do, what do you think about that? Right. I, I've, I think that's really the key question because, uh, and, and not just for Republicans, but in, in general, how this conversation is had in public, if you believe that life begins at conception, um, and the, so if you believe life begins at conception, your legislative priorities are going to be very different than whether you believe viability is the standard or whether you believe uh, anything. I mean, whether you believe in exceptions for rape and incest. And I think the pro-life movement has talked about um, the issue of abortion very in a, in a way that was very much tailored to the row moment, the the row norm, um, and now that there's an opportunity for the pro life movement, the conservative movement, the Republican Party to uh, you know do policies that aren't just working around row but are working yeah. in a in a post row world. Um, you know, I, I think the conversation is is going to it's going to push a lot of Republicans into an uncomfortable space um, that they, they don't want to be in. I think some of them, if I were like telling, if I were advising people um, and I know the last thing that establishment Republicans want is armchair quarterbacks um, and conservative media giving them unsolicited advice. Um, but what I would tell them to do is to uh, be honest about what they think and to be honest about if they believe life begins at conception, your policy, Policies should be honest reflections of that and your rhetoric should be an honest reflection of that because I don't think people are inclined to believe you actually think life begins at conception if you do not act as though you think um, that abortions after conception um, are taking life. And that is just absolutely critical, I think, going forward. And, you know, one thing I think uh, Inez would appreciate or one maybe broader piece of context, I think Inez would appreciate us framing this discussion in is the the sexual revolution discussion. And I wrote a piece about this right away on Friday um, and, and how 
Gen Z right now is currently like rethinking the sexual revolution. Even BuzzFeed wrote a long story about how, quote, sex positivity is sort of fallen out of favor with uh, Gen Z, with maybe younger millennials who um, have really been hurt by hookup culture in so many ways that these norms that were set by elder millennials, by Xers and by boomers um, ha have turned out to be an experiment that was harmful to a lot of women. And I don't think you can talk about the sexual revolution, and I think feminists would agree, without also talking about abortion. And whatever you think of abortion, it's a, this in industry of... Um, what's the right way, sort of technologically advanced abortion, where it went sort of from the, the back alleys, uh, the dangerous, treacherous back alleys into medical facilities. Um, now there are pills. It's, it's sort of been very like technologically advanced and sanitized and industrialized. Um, that is very new to civilization. Um, even some contraception me methods are very new to civilization. In vitro fertilization um, is new to civilization. And that's not to say all technologies that we just talked about are bad. That's not to say all technology in general is bad. It's just to say that this is very, very different. Um, and the world changed very quickly in about 50 years. Um, and so I'm curious, Maddie, what you think about how as it's as the as the sort of uh, consequences of the sexual revolution are becoming more and more manifest um, in younger people who aren't quite reactionary, but are definitely sort of fumbling around in the dark looking for the answer to problems caused by the sexual revolution. How do you think this conversation then will unfold in that broader context? Yeah, so I found initially before before we get to the, the abortion part of this i found the me too movement especially in the last five to ten years like really really fascinating because i saw in it women beginning to understand that this whole you can have sex like men the whole sex and city mm -hmm. line right wasn't really working out that well for them okay they would they would engage in these these hookups um they would behave as as men right disinhibited men they they have contraception they don't have to worry about pregnancy that's the that's the idea um and yet they they would feel kind of degraded they'd feel hurt there was a lot going on there and some of that was sort of this as has been talked about many times by other people this this sort of retrospective withdrawal of consent so you consent at the time but then you think better about it later and then you think actually did i consent at the time because if i consent at the time why do i feel so miserable and there was this huge focus on consent and the whole thing was obviously bankrupt by partisan uh, mechanisms. I mean, it was just people were using it for cynical reasons, like transparently cynical reasons. So it got less interesting, it got boring. But that in itself, that initial dissatisfaction, I think it was that story in the New Yorker, Cat Person. But oh, really, yes, yes. Really sordid affair, young, young girl goes to college has a sexual relationship basically because she thinks it would be impolite to refuse him. Okay, so she's not really attracted to him. She doesn't really see a future with him, but he expects sex and she just thinks like, oh, okay, it would it'd be like ordering, I think the line is like, it'd be like ordering something from the menu and then when it arrives, like saying, actually, I don't want this, turn it back. So she goes through with this and she feels degraded and awful. And I think, you know, rather than this focus on consent, the question of, of abortion and the question of pregnancy, as opposed to just like the sexual act, introduces this question of commitment, right? This other C word, commitment. And we we had this huge emphasis on like not slut shaming. That was like, let's mm. not slut shame. I remember actually it was uh, Norm MacDonald and his posthumous uh, yes. thing has this this really funny joke where he's like, you know, I was way ahead of the curve on this, guys. Like, right back in high school, I was saying, like, no, don't don't shame the sluts. If you shame the sluts, you know, they'll stop having sex with us. Why would we want to shame the sluts? <laughs> right, exactly. But, but, but in that, you know, it, it's perceptive, right? Because it's, it's noticing that, yes, of course, stigmatizing people and 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 making people feel awful because of decisions is just not a very kind way to be and we shouldn't do that but at the same time there's something valuable in shame in that it teaches you to protect yourself the same way like you put your 
hand on a hot stove and it hurts you withdraw your hand right there's something about shame that is like you know this isn't good for me and I think that in the same way that we used to okay so that's not very nice word it's not very nice to you know make it all about the women here but we did have an equivalent and the equivalent for men was like thinking of a very like 1950s term right here but it's like the cad right yeah, yeah the, right. the 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 lout the the womanizer the, the just basically a really despicable person who who uses women and 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 that's what we would we would see as we see somebody who uses women and before abortion was thinkable to most women because remember even yes okay we've always had people who in acts of desperation have sought out uh, abortions but for the vast majority of women up until really post-sexual revolution 70s it was unthinkable for you to get pregnant you would that your options were you have the baby you give the baby up for adoption um or before you're pregnant you you're absent or take the risk with the contraception but but i actually think that what what that dynamic was that was a woman realized that she had the burden here okay that the idea that she could behave like a man was just like a completely foreign concept so she she had the burden um so if she was going to engage in sex with a guy the bare minimum she could reasonably expect reasonably expect and society would would support her and reasonably expecting that would be should they get pregnant he commits shotgun wedding right she could reasonably expect that and if he failed he would be stigmatized now what we did with contraception and abortion is we shifted that it it, it is not i i was watching friends like recently and oh just good like, yeah, I, I mean, I love Friends. I forget if it's interesting, especially because we've moved so far since the 90s. But when Rachel gets pregnant yes, and she has this conversation with Ross and she's like, no, I just want you to know, like, I don't expect anything from you. And like this. And I'm thinking, like, why? Why would she let him off the hook like that? At bare minimum. OK, maybe they don't want to get married. But like at bare minimum, he should be paying child support. He should be mm -hmm. showing up. He should be looking after this kid and taking an interest. Right. But she doesn't expect that. Society wouldn't have expected that. And the reason for that is because it's an affirmative choice that she's made to continue the pregnancy, mm -hmm. right? So to get back to your, this is very long rambling. No, no, this is actually perfect. Yeah, but to your, your point about how is this going to change the dynamic? I don't see this changing overnight. I mean, our, our generation, women younger than us, women older than us have lived their entire lives with an expectation of accessible abortion as a backstop to a contraceptive lifestyle. Okay, so it's not going to change overnight. But ideally, what you would see is people joining the dots between, we're really not happy with the, the prevailing sexual ethic right now, like, hence me too, hence this like confusion around consent and dissatisfaction with hookup culture maybe we just expect more from men maybe we just uh, like maybe this whole bro choice thing of guys who like david portnoy who want to have their lifestyle and then they are outraged that abortion isn't available and it's like these things are connected <laughs> you know maybe that starts to become socially unacceptable again I would welcome that. I I would very much welcome if we if we don't go to the, the the slut shaming route. That's fine, but let's let's at least like bring back some shaming of guys who don't step up. Mm. And a lot of people would say that shame never existed, which is incorrect, as you point out. Right? Incorrect. The, the yeah. feminists would argue men never face the the stigma um, for abandoning women in those situations. But I, I, this is actually a really excellent. And before we do segue, I have some thoughts on everything you just said. But the next item on the docket, as Inez likes to say, is is actually going to be Title IX. Um, and there's so much to talk about when it comes to Title IX and our sexual ethics um, in this country and in the 21st century. Um, and, and to that point, Maddie, everything you said, it was, it was so interesting because you're right that the expectation, the norm for people like us, the, the downfall of Roe, and you've heard this from a lot of people in the pro-life movement in the last, you know, 
couple of days was unthinkable. It was it was a fantasy, a, a conservative fantasy, basically, that Roe would ever go anywhere whatsoever. And here we are, June of 2022, and Roe's gone. And so for both the left and the right, something happened really quickly that that suddenly abortion was this this norm, the standard, this expectation that felt like it was etched in stone almost into the Constitution itself, because Roe was always considered settled law and untouchable. And as we know, that didn't turn out to be the case, but it does change the way in the same way that contraception technologies like IUD technology, um, the pill itself, um, all of these things really changed the way that human beings had sex um, in the last, you know, in the West in the last uh, half century. And so that's a really important part of this conversation because uh, abortion started to be legalized um, in the years leading up to Roe itself. And it, it was even Janet Yellen co-authored a paper with her husband in the late 90s for the Brookings Institute that found abortion actually increased single motherhood because people were having uh, more premarital sex uh, because you just psychologically, and this is not, I I'm putting my own read on the paper, um, although that's what Yellen concluded, that this had to do with the, the uh, change in abortion law. But you can see psychologically, women just had a different idea about what options were available to them. Um, and, and that's why I think it's, it's so important to have this conversation in the context of all of the changes that have happened technologically um, just over the last half century. Like, it's a really big deal. And we think of these things as normal, and we think of these things as rights, but the the point you just made about how women have it's, it's another important thing to remember like the choice isn't about whether to continue with a pregnancy the choice in a consensual situation so majority of, of abortions if it was consensual the choice is to have sex outside of a relationship mm -hmm. with somebody where you want to get pregnant the this is the outcome of sex. We know that, right. that it's it's function, it's biological function. Uh, and so I think women believe and have been conditioned to believe that they're entitled to have sex exactly as men do, which is with no physical consequence, that you have a right not to have that physical consequence of your own decision. Um, and, and we've just sort of taken the, shifted the burden um, that way, like sex is, it's just, it's something you do for pleasure. Um, and, and that's purely it. And it's, I think, become really dangerous. And, and that's actually a good segue into the Title IX docket item, um, which is, we're going from row to Title IX and then taking a hard pivot on item three in the docket to the southern border. But while we're on this topic of sexual ethics, um, Maddie, the Biden administration finally released its plan to revise the Title IX guidelines back to the Obama era Title IX guidelines um, away from the improvements that Bet Betsy DeVos had made to them, which had been lauded by even her most bitter enemies, including the Washington Post editorial board, including writers for The Atlantic this, this was broadly considered by pretty much everybody who followed the issue closely that didn't happen to be a partisan arm of the Democratic Party or an a the fringe activist Democratic Party. This was considered an improvement. Um, and we uh, and the Obama era guidelines that will be returned to after the comment period, um, because that's how our administrative state works. They give you this fig leaf of uh, input into the process by having a notice and comment period. Um, so the Obama era guidelines were a disaster. Everybody sort of knew that anyway. Um, this was, they were considered kangaroo courts, um, major law groups spoke out against them. Um, they had this, it, I, I would say there were three major problems with them. And Inez as a lawyer is even, uh, it, it, she's, she has a, a much more granular understanding of this. She's been working on this issue for years and years and years, but, um, that's not to call her old, although she is, but the, the, <laughs> I would say there were three, she loves when I do that. Uh, there were, there were three big, uh, I think you can sort of categorize the problems with the Obama era rules in, in three particular ways. One, they used an overly broad definition of sexual assault and sexual harassment to the point where it was almost meaningless, defining just about every unpleasant interaction um, that a woman can have with a man in as potentially, if she wanted it to be, 
as sexual harassment. Like it was just such a broad definition. Uh, The second area of this would be that they did it via Dear Colleague letter. So there were two, there were three Title IX Dear Colleague letters. Um, One was about uh, transgender sports issues. Um, And the other two were about uh, Title IX as it pertains to adjudicating sexual assault and harassment. Uh, Those were the first two. Um, And Dear Colleague letters are anti-democratic, as all of the people outside the Supreme Court uh, right now are claiming is the case with the the overturning of Roe. Um, These are basically completely subvert the process of Republican government that we have in this country. And they give legislative power, power that clearly belongs to the legislature, to unelected bureaucrats who can govern by fiat because they tether public funding to these dear colleague letters. And if you do not follow them, then you have that problem. Um, And it created a nightmare. The third issue, um, I would say, in addition to all of those those problems is they created kangaroo courts um, beyond just that definition, the, the problem of the definition. They created kangaroo courts by uh, basically eliminating due process. You could empower the single investigator model, which is what Biden wants to go back with. One bureaucrat um, is involved in adjudicating this uh, in many cases. It changed the standard of evidence um, from preponderance to clear and convincing, which might not sound like a big deal, but in practice is an absolutely huge deal. Um, they took out cross examinations um, under this idea. It's very, very much the um, what's the best way to describe it, it was the, the Greg Lukianoff book um, in a very sort of like fragility. Yeah, the uh, coddling of the American mind. Yeah, right. The coddling of the American mind uh, with Jonathan Haidt. But it was, it's very much the fragility ethics for yeah. millennials, right, that a cross examination uh, re-traumatizes victims and is therefore unfair, even though it is a necessary element of due process. Now, those are the three buckets um, in the just as we're dealing with uh, adjudicating sexual assault and harassment. The fourth thing is that there was another Dear Colleague letter in 2016. Um, I think it was May of 2016 from John King at the end of the Obama administration that read gender identity into on the basis of sex, the famous phrase in Title IX. Mm -hmm. Biden's uh, administration is doing a couple different things with that. He is first already in the proposed guidelines included gender identity, says gender identity needs to be included when we think of sex. But he's also said we're going to put out different guidelines as it pertains to trans sports. Maddie, so much to deal with there. Um, It was a huge announcement. There's so much to talk about because uh, the media is ignoring it or taking the Biden administration's talking points directly and inserting them into their headlines when they say Biden's new Title IX guidelines would protect trans athletes um, or, or trans students is what I saw a lot of in the headlines. But let me throw it to you with this and you can take it wherever you want. You can go back okay. to Roe. You can go back to the sexual revolution. You can tie it all together. Have fun with it. But I'm going to throw it to you with this. It is deeply inconsistent for the Biden administration to say we need separate guidelines for athletics because if gender identity is in fact, and I mean that phrase literally, if gender identity is in fact equal to sex, then you should have no reason to issue separate guidelines for sports because it is plainly sex. If on the other hand, it is not the same as sex, equal to sex as they claim, then it has no place being read into Title IX, which is specific to sex for a reason. So with that, I'll say, take it away. Okay, well, I'm going to start where you left off Mm -hmm. with this. Why did they treat sports differently? And I think it's because they have realized that that is a losing issue. Yes, I think we we have seen this in the international context. We've seen the World Swimming Organization come out and basically say, unless you transitioned before puberty, this isn't fair. This isn't fair for women. So we're going to exclude you. The cycling, International Cycling Association, that, that's not its name, it's a French name, but did, did the same thing, did a similar thing. Something, it was less um, less robust than that. It was something to do with hormones, but it was certainly like leaning towards exclusion of male athletes. And it's just think of how much controversy the Leah Thomas 
thing got in the US. And that's that's without mainstream media being honest about it. Alternative media had a huge breakthrough, I think. And I think that's that's something where they have they're out of step with even people even liberals and even Democrats. And so I actually found that sort of gratifying. It was a, it was a nod to okay, like we 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 realized like we're gonna have to at least be diplomatic on this one. We're gonna have to to figure it out. You're right, of course, that it's massively inconsistent, but when has inconsistency ever bothered them? <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, the whole, whole thing's pretty inconsistent. Yeah. Um but the the due process thing is is interesting to me because when I first like found out about these sort of category courts, um, so I moved over to the US in 2016 and was aware of what was going on under Obama era guidance regulations. And my first question, sort of naively, uh, to my NYU classmates who were discussing <laughs> this, I think we were reading like Laura Kipnis's book, and oh, I boy. said, "Yeah." And I and said, NYU, no, NYU was not home to Mattress Girl. That was Columbia. That so was never Columbia. mind. Yeah, yes, yeah, Emma Solkowitz. Yes. So my first question was, where I come from, these offenses are crimes yeah if somebody sexually assaults you if somebody sexually harasses you if you are raped you don't go to some administrator you call the police Mm -hmm. and and then you you go through the legal system i why is this like even even if let's just let's just say even if they it wasn't atrocious in terms of due process even if it was the, these these kangaroo courts weren't they weren't kangaroo courts they were they were sort of pseudo judicial setups where there was like a like a ostensibly fair so, I mean, why are you doing this why is this your role i don't understand mm-hmm. so i just i just object to it on that grounds but it's also it totally relates to what we're talking about before with the the sexual revolution and this beginning to understand that something isn't working and instead of working through that and and taking some responsibility for maybe choices that you're making or lifestyle decisions you're making that aren't making you happy it it becomes just resentment so and this is something that that's kind of why I think you know I, I find I find myself sort of defending the due process rights of of people who I think behave like pigs okay now a pig isn't a rapist they're different things a, a, a pig isn't the same as a predator necessarily okay you could be a frat boy who totally objectifies women and just hooks up in a completely irresponsible way gets really drunk whatever treats women like with no respect I think the proper way of, of approaching that is treating it as a moral issue and having, again, like I would like to see a resurgence of shame because I think, <laughs> and, and yes, a little bit of stigma, not maybe, maybe not like going too far, but yes, I think somebody who behaves like that should be ashamed, but I don't, I don't think we should start like accusing them of criminal behavior. But the right. thing is, the, the, the problem is, is that we have this, this culture this prevailing ethic where everything is absolutely fine morally fine it's all like anything goes you could be at a cocktail party and you could say you're into like the weirdest stuff you could you could say like a, a you could say you're into i don't know like <laughs> tying people up my ear like i think we know what weird stuff is maddie you know? <laughs> you want to defecate on people i don't know like whatever it is yeah whatever it is and people hey. go oh good for you that's so that's so interesting yes. you're so worldly but the moment somebody touches your leg and you didn't give them a green light and do you know what that usually means it means somebody you're not attracted to hitting on you yeah. that's what it that's what it normally means well <laughs> No, seriously, because because think about it. No, think about it. Right, if if people reading each other's body language, body language, and like nobody actually, I, I refuse to believe anybody actually has sex in the way of may I now do this? May I now do that? May I now do this? May I now do that? Like that is just, I mean, it was just like be total turn off anyway. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand how that works. So what it happens is. The unattractive make advances, and rather than just being rejected and humiliated, 
and they would learn from that. That is also a valuable life experience to be rejected and humiliated. It's like I was harassed, I was whatever. So I just think that we need to bring back the separation of being able to say that is morally, that is not a good, that is not good behavior. That's bad behavior. And I disapprove of that behavior. And I don't want to behave in a way that encourages that behavior. But that is not the same thing as that person has committed a crime. And so, first of all, I think Title IX and the the latest regulations are just a complete mess because they conflate those two things and and don't actually address any of the real issues that need to be addressed. But but the, the, the redefinition of sex is to include gender identity is kind of interesting as well honestly because it's how how can you if if the whole assumption of feminism is that there is gender asymmetry and so there's gender based violence sex based violence sorry i'm 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 doing what they do in conflating those two terms yeah. sex well cuz gender used to just be like uh, you know polite or more polite way of saying like sex but, but sex there's these sex differences and, and women are more vulnerable but if we redefine women to include men how i'm i'm curious as to what you think how do these two things work together how do these two things not contradict each other if we're saying we need to hold men who misbehave to hire account and have these kangaroo courts and resuscitate the kangaroo courts. But at the same time, we're saying like, we are actually aren't sure what a woman is. Mm-hmm. No, I don't, yeah, don't really it's incompatible. Mm-hmm. It's, it's incompatible. And that's, you, you know, you, you come from the land of the turfs. Um, that's where the turfs come from, right? <laughs> turf that's Island. Where you, <laughs> turf Island, right. That's where you get JK Rowling. That's where you get, um, uh, I think Karadansky, um, it's where you get your Matt Taibis, where you get people um, who are, are from the far left uh, that, you know, via horseshoe theory have now come around uh, and, and are joining arms with people on the far right on this specific question because you, you Title IX in and of itself is such an interesting, I think, microcosm of the problems plaguing the feminist movement. When we talk about Roe, when we talk about all of these other states that had legalized abortion before Roe, the Title IX was signed by Richard Nixon. It was not, you know, it, it, it was part of, it was seen as part of this, the second wave's major legislative accomplishments. Um, and the feminist movement has championed Title IX for years against conservative opposition, basically saying this is an encroachment of the federal government that creates more problems than it solves. It hurts men's sports, et cetera, et cetera. And I actually kind of sympathize with that position, but it's it's been sort of interesting to watch. Like, for instance, last week was the 50th anniversary of Title IX, and that's why Biden released these guidelines last week. Um, it, it was allegedly to celebrate Title IX. There, you know, we could talk to uh, some of the great athletes, female athletes that work with IWF, um, and just talk to them and say they're all in a position where their peers, people who are following their paths, are women are going to be hurt by the Biden administration's pro woman nonsense because it's actually pro man <laughs> I mean, right. it's just it's just you're you're just having more net men going that are biological men people who have had privileges um in certain spaces whether it's you know just being privileged to have a body that is more equipped to do athletic competitions in many different contexts um or not having to menstruate one week out of every mm-hmm. month um, right. or you know not having to carry the child which privilege isn't the right word because that's a privilege for women um, but you know, there's certainly, if your goals are professional, um, privileges to being a man yeah. who doesn't have to carry the child. Uh, so yes, there it's, it is fundamentally incompatible. It makes absolutely no sense. And so that's why I think Title IX is so useful as a glimpse into the problems that are plaguing the, the feminist movement as they've um, really been founded increasingly so on this bedrock of moral relativism um, that's I think also allowing this transhumanist ideology to fester that we can escape the things that make us unhappy um, and it's wrecking a generation of women it did great damage to the millennial generation it is doing 
more damage to Gen Z as it gets worse and worse. And Maddie, you've reported extensively. You had a wonderful cover story for NR um, a while back, probably a year or two ago, on uh, trans issues kind of generally and then specifically in some cases. And since we're talking about the Biden administrations and we spent a, a little bit of time just now on, on Title IX, um, you I'll preface this by saying one of the quote red pill moments of my life was when I was uh, an intern for the great Christina Hoff Summers over at the American Enterprise Institute. I was helping with a re-release of her absolutely excellent classic book, The War Against Boys. And uh, my job was to sort of go through the old footnotes and the new footnotes, compare them, make sure uh, studies that have been cited were up to date, accurate, um, et cetera, et cetera. And when I was going through some of the studies on that Christina writes about and looking at how they define sexual harassment and sexual assault, when you look at those studies and you see it under their methodology that this is the definition, this is the question we pose to people on the phone, catcalling in some cases was included in the definition. And it was like everything the media tells you is wrong when you just read the studies yourself. That's sort of how I saw it. It was like a light bulb moment. And, um, you know, people, it's the job of journalists to be the intermediary, right? To be the person that reads the study because uh, normal people who are happy enough not to go into journalism don't have <laughs> to do it. So, uh, Maddie, I imagine you had similar moments of like, whoa, uh, as you were reporting that wonderful cover story out, even though you'd been covering that issue for a while, it was a very in-depth uh, piece of journalism. So I wanted to ask if you could just talk to us about reporting that story out. And uh, when you look back on writing it now in the context of Biden inexplicably swinging uh, from what most people considered an improvement to what most people people considered across the political spectrum to be uh, a bad state of affairs. Yeah, so I think I think the cover story you're referring to was um, 2019, and I think it was the one about uh, James Younger. And yes. I, I, this was this was kind of like the hook, but it was it was much it was about much more than him. And this yes. is a was a little boy is a little boy um, in Texas, and there was a very messy custody dispute between his parents and his mother. Uh, wanted to raise him as a girl and start him on the whole puberty blocking and, and so on. And his father was completely against this. And so they were having this, this struggle, this tug of war, essentially, over a child. Um, and it was, it was jumped on by liberal media and they were very much like on the, on the trans narrative and, and uh, and and what I basically uh, did, I had I had pretty good sourcing on the story because um, I was able to to get materials from the depositions and in the hearings and see who their expert witnesses were and see what their expert witnesses were saying, um, and really shed a light on the whole industry, especially with tra child transition, which is the most disturbing part of the entire transgender phenomenon is child transition because it's often the most vulnerable children imaginable. I mean, I was I had access at one point to a Facebook group with tens of, well, it was 8,000 parents who are transing their kids. And there were people posting pictures of like young teenage girls with Down syndrome having had double mastectomies and just like the craziest stuff. So, but th the reason I think that, and it's, it's crazy to think that that was like, what, for four years ago that's amazing coming up for yeah. and that to me was I I just felt that the whole trans thing is so shrouded in euphemism it's actually kind of confusing to even know where to begin in debunking the euphemism because what they what what is actually kind of a complicated awful process that requires a couple of sentences to explain. If I was to try to explain, explain to you, okay, they're turning children into transsexuals by doing this, 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 and this, and this specific thing. I, I'm, I'm going to spend like a paragraph on that, but what they say is gender affirming care. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that sounds really nice. Sounds really affirming. That's nice. Um, I mean, the whole, the whole thing is, is that. So being able to actually just, just get the get your hands on the facts. 
wh which doctors are doing this? What are they doing? What are they telling patients? What are the results? And the the way I chose to to write the piece was really just to like thoroughly report because the facts, if you just t strip it from that euphemistic jargon, the facts just speak for themselves. It's it's just shocking. It's it's shocking um, that they would lie to to children about something really really fundamental um and then basically conduct reckless experiments on them because that that's what you're doing there is no reason to think and there's no long-term studies and nor should there be because in order to get long-term studies you need a randomized control group and you need to start experimenting on some of the kids and not on the others and compare the results and the, the you know the question is and I, th I think often the sane people in this debate end up on the defensive, but it's like, you want to do this absolutely radical thing, turn children, something that would be absolutely unthinkable a few decades ago, turn children into transsexuals before they've even reached sexual maturity. You, ha you have to make the case for why. Okay. Yeah. It's not on us to explain why you shouldn't, because the first principle in medicine is first do no harm. It, you, it's something I think a lot of people don't seem to realize, and, and this is a difference between British and American healthcare, but you want to avoid surgery if you possibly can. You want to avoid taking medication if you possibly can, because every single thing you introduce into your body has side effects, it has potential risks, it could introduce new, new problems. And so if there is a way of avoiding taking those risks, if there is a way of being healthy without it, you take that route. And the incredible thing is, um, if you look at the history of how we how we treated gender confused youth in the past, uh, well, for most of them didn't need serious clinical help anyway. It was just a passing phase, which we've now like turned into a big complex by pathologizing normal childhood expression. But but there was a you know it was a, a significant minority of kids who had had the deep rooted gender confusion, and the the clinicians helping them. This is like pre nineteen nineties before they started experimenting. Uh, realized that. Uh, that the best possible thing would be for them to accept their sex by the end of adolescence because why because it's easier to change your mind especially if you're a child mm -hmm. it's easier to change your mind than to entirely rewire <clears throat> your in, your sex body and what's well, not possible which's well, not possible yeah right. right so it's obviously the ideal outcome and what's incredible is that the claim now and you have like serious people claiming this it's not it's not just the people that Matt Walsh interviewed in his documentary you have New York Times columnists claiming this stuff saying that what I just described like recognizing that as the ideal outcome is conversion therapy and hate speech by the way hate speech and literally abuse. yeah I mean and that's the problem with these Title IX rec this, these new Title IX uh, regulations is that they actually are really going. There, there were speech problems before with the broad definition of sexual harassment, but if you read gender identity into Title IX pronouns, um, basically become a form of sex-based discrimination. And it, so, if if you use the wrong pronoun, and you can be facing a Title IX complaint. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like extended to mean like sexual. Sexual. What you just said. Literally yeah, what, what I you just, just said. What I just said is sexual harassment. I mean, I know I had a, a New York Times uh, columnist like retweeted one of my articles like a couple of weeks ago, and said that I was essentially saying that it's better. It it would be better if trans people didn't exist, right? And actually, what I was I was talking about was what I just articulated to you, right? Which it's the ideal outcome in these therapeutic contexts. It would be better for a patient not to have gender dysphoria than to have it, clearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reason they're seeking help, clinical help, is because there's a problem. You don't go to a therapist if everything's fine. You don't go to a doctor if everything's fine. Of course it would be better if they weren't gender dysphoric. And now, if you, if you want to define transgenderism to mean it as Camille Paglia meant it, 
fine. I don't care. Right. That's fine. You know, you, which you is wanna... not what anybody means when they no, say that anymore. No. No. But but the thing is, you you can't have it both ways. Is it an identity or is it a medical problem? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you're just talking about the identity, I really couldn't care less. I don't care if there's goths. I don't care if there's people who are trans. I don't. That, that's that's absolutely fine. Whatever. If if it, if it's a medical problem, and it requires treatment. That treatment should be based in material reality. It should be based in the, the, the type of care that has the greatest efficacy and safety and the least ideological motivation. And that is just such a common sense statement that it is truly disturbing <laughs> that, that anybody could take objection to it. You'd think. Um, and yet here, think. We are. And here we are. St- I need to cut off this hateful rant um, before we get into <laughs> legal trouble. Uh, no, no. It, it, actually, speaking of Camille Paglia, I, I think uh, this was, gosh, 2017. I, if I'm thinking of the right thing, I went uh, up to New York at the time to see uh, Camille Paglia talk to Andy Cohen um, at an event. And she said, I think this was then, that when the Dear Colleague letter came down on Title IX and gender identity from the Obama administration, that's when she thought Hillary Clinton was going to lose the election (laughs) or that Democrats are going to lose the election. And I I think that uh, goes to your point about why they're now trying to do separate guidelines when it comes specifically to sports, which Mm. is, I I think, an intellectual contradiction. Um, But that's an important point that they have really started to lose momentum um, because of Leah Thomas, who you've reported on extensively. You did. You went to some swim meets, didn't you? I did. I went to the NCAA. (laughs) No offense. (laughs) It's really funny. People have asked me, they're like, you really care about the sports issue? Are you you an athlete? I'm like, no, I'm a woman. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we shouldn't let women play sports. (laughs) i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding no um but the uh the yeah but the the, i was there when leah thomas was thrashing the girls and dominating them and it was just like really the most incredible thing yeah the most incredible thing but yeah this is this is where the momentum shift has has come in and speaking of uh issues that the media misrepresents and that the public generally doesn't have an idea of what's really happening um, on Inez asked me to talk a little bit before we wrap up about uh, my trip to uh, the southern border and to northern Mexico this month. Um, it was quite interesting. The Federalist is going to be putting out a documentary. My colleague John Daniel Davidson really led the trip. We went with David Ogren, who's a great journalist based in Mexico City. Um, he's written two dispatches that are worth consuming every word of um, because they are based really on what we saw in northern Mexico and that's a side of the story that the media is completely disinterested in. Um, we we talked to migrants um, for days and we had very detailed, very uh, tragic conversations with them. Obviously, it's, it's nearly impossible to verify the details of their stories. Um, but it is very true that each person who tries to cross into the United States is a customer to the cartels. And our lax and confusing, confusing border policy is a, a payday for the cartels. It is exploited by them. Our policy benefits them. It has allowed them to industrialize the migrant passages from South and Central America over the Rio Grande River. Um, and that is a problem, not only because it enriches cartels, but because it endangers so many desperate people. Um, and on that note, one of the things I, uh, you, know, you walk away from, we, we would walk into Matamoros, for instance. Um, we, we went to Matamoros in Reynosa. So on the, the Eastern side of the, the border between Texas and Mexico. And, as soon as we walked into Matamoros, right across from the bridge, right on the street, as you're walking off the bridge over the river um, into Mexico, there's a congregation of Haitian migrants um, that are basically living on the streets. There have been different encampments that were con- clear- that were cleared over time, and you start talking to them and ask, "When was the last time you lived in Haiti?" For a lot of them, uh, for all of them, it's 
more than like a couple of years, right? They have not been in Haiti in years. Um, but for a lot of them, it's five years, closer to 10 years after the earthquake of 2010. Um, and they have uh, been living in Chile or uh, Brazil or Argentina or even in like Tijuana. And they're over in Matamoros now or Reynosa or any of these border towns uh, in, you know, Tijuana itself now because they want to get into the United States. They specifically want to live in the United States. And it is so th their lives and their idea, their perception is that their lives are so miserable, whether they're Honduran or Nicaraguan or Salvadorian, their lives are so miserable. They would rather sleep on the streets or in a shelter and take these treacherous journeys uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles up through Mexico just for a chance to get into the United States. It's, it's better for them to sleep on the streets, to live in a, a, a shelter that's crowded um, than it is to continue to exist in their countries where they feel like they'll tell you over and over again, they have no future. They uh, endure kidnappings, they endure beatings, they endure all kinds of danger and they know it, they know it's gonna happen, but it's all for the chance to get into the United States of America, because that's where they want to be so badly. Almost all of them have family. Uh, pretty much everyone we talked to had family living in the United States. When one family that we talked to with a tiny little daughter, so cute, when they were kidnapped within recent days that we talked to them, uh, they had to have their family living in the United States get a Western Union to the cartel so that they could be released. So they were held in captivity for a few days until a member of their family could just come up with enough money to send it to the cartel and get them released. Uh, we talked to somebody who, uh, we, we talked to someone who ran a shelter who talked about people who had recently crossed the river. You have to pay the cartels to cross the river. When you get into Mexico, they give you a number. You have to pay them to basically Sherpa you through Mexico. You have to pay them to get across the river. Sometimes it's the same uh, it's, it's the same price um, but this this shelter leader had seen people cross the river the cartel literally pulled them out of the water that's how closely they patrol the border asked them if they had their number what their number was and when they said they didn't have a number the cartel pulled them out and brought them back to mexico brought them back to the other side of the river because everybody is a customer um, and so our, 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 our policy is so confusing. It's not clear. I'll, I'll just end by this, this long sort of detailing of uh, my, my attempt to condense um, a few days over in northern Mexico and in uh, South Texas into you know, a, a, um, a dispatch here uh, is, is to say we talked to one leader of a shelter. Actually, he's a leader of a Bible school. He's run a Bible school in, uh, in Matamoros for years and years that he had to transition into a shelter because the situation had got so bad. Um, and he, as he's now running the shelter, he told us he has meetings with the U.S. consulate regularly and tells them, please put out a statement in plain English explaining exactly what the United States border policy is, what you have to do to meet the asylum criteria, what you have to do to qualify to actually cross Put it out there in plain Spanish. And, you know, this is going to help the problem a lot because there's so much disinformation that's fomented by the cartels, that's promulgated by the cartels, that just comes from people who did cross the border illegally or hired a lawyer and ended up getting in. Um, and it, it, it incentivizes people to take these very treacherous journeys. Well, they never do. They never do. Um, I don't know why, uh, but Maddie, as somebody who comes from a country uh, and, and a part of the world where there have been, uh, certainly, if you, you look at London and, and other areas, uh, th there have been issues with migration, with asylum seeking. Um, but this question of a southern border um, is very different. You don't have a failed state. Um, you know, right across the, a, a river, basically. Um, and the, the difference between what it looks like just as you're crossing the bridge on one side or the other is obviously vast. Um, but it, what do you make of the predicament we find ourselves in as a country um, from a perspective of somebody who, who actually does have a different perspective, perhaps outside perspective for a lot of your life? Sure. So I actually really appreciate the... Um the writings of Lionel Shriver on, oh, on, the, yes. on the issue of immigration and, and especially 
this particular issue of the, the border. I think that she, uh, so she's an American novelist, but she lives in London, I think. And she she's been on Federalist Radio Hour. Oh, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of her. Hers, uh, she always gets invited on places to talk about um, school shootings because of her novel. We need to talk about Kevin, but but what she what she does with this issue, she sort of says, look, whenever we're having these conversations, we need to we need to acknowledge something, which is there's just something like inherently unfair and seemingly random that some people are born in countries like the United States and other people are born in hell holes. And I think any sort of humane policy has to start with a sense of gratitude that, frankly, that's not you. That's not the situation mm -hmm. you inherited. And a sense of, of, of reasonable, prudent generosity um, to, to people. Now, of course, the country, a country cannot take everyone. It shouldn't have to take everyone it's it's got to think of its own interest that's just that's just how it works and one thing I will tell you like I could I could I could talk about the similar problems we have in the UK and how it's very like we I mean, we have people uh, yeah we're not we don't have a, a land lock situation but we have people taking this treacherous journey yeah. across the channel and these are these are people who have been in other countries before like they're they're leaving they're fleeing France okay like Oh, they may have originally been in I would. Home, but <laughs> <laughs> talk about <laughs> shithole countries. No, but they're, they're you know they're 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 kind of like constantly chasing like Nirvana, like the the most wonderful. But but the thing is, I do I do think that it's it's related to the absolute incoherent mess of legal immigration. Okay, so I like have. What would you know about that, Maddie? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it is not. One does not sim simply walk into Mordor. Okay, if you want to come, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to the United States, oh, I, I, I could, I could talk for two hours about this, and I'm not. Have going you to tried it. swimming? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> but no. Seriously, it's it is just the. It is a. Be grinding bureaucracy it is mindless it is maddening it is expensive and look the united states has a labor shortage it has it, it has a rich history of immigration like i'm very pro legal immigration like my philosophy is <laughs> sure you are <laughs> <laughs> completely nothing to do with me yeah <laughs> but you know it i i, I think big walls big doors okay and those two things are related because you need to disincentivize illegal immigration and you need to incentivize legal immigration by making it accessible. People should at least be able to apply. Now, like I said before, a country does not have to take anyone. Nobody's entitled to enter a country that they weren't born in. That's, that's just the way it is. But it, it's so, it's just, that's never going to change because Immigrants are potential immigrants or, or, or immigrants are are not voting constituents, right? They don't have a vote, so they can't lobby Congress. They can't get things changed. Um, they just have to suck it up. And I, I honestly cannot tell you how many times people have said to me, you should just get fraudulently married or you should just bubble. No, seriously, like there's people yeah. who just do this. They do it because it's easier. Yeah. Okay. So if you're that desperate to come to the United States and you really are, you're not, you're not a criminal and you're not whatever, but you, you really, really believe in the U S and you're attracted to it and you think you have something to offer. And I'm not, I'm not one of those people who thinks it should be only highly skilled immigrants. Like I, I'm happy to have people coming to the United States to do jobs that Americans don't want to do. Like, yes. Uh, the, just like yourself, for instance. <laughs> Yeah, taking on transgenderism. Exactly. Everything. Yeah. No, like, you mean, know, seriously, like I, you I, don't, you don't have any skills. <laughs> I, none, none whatsoever. <laughs> Certainly not sports. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I think that's great. But line up, get in line, get your paperwork in order, learn English, okay, and and be grateful. I think it's just like a kind of there's there's a just 
recklessness, obviously, but it, it it's it's incentivized and it's incentivized by obviously Biden and the Democrats for purely cynical, insincere political reasons, talking the talk on immigration and meaning none of it. And of course that incentivized people to hurl themselves at the southern border because they genuinely believe like Mr. Biden, he's a nice guy. He'll not send me back. He'll let me in. Do you, do you know how many clips I have, and this will be in the documentary, of migrants saying exactly that? I exactly that. Yes. I and some of them don't follow the news very closely, but others just right. have this general sense that when the administration changed, uh, he would be less harsh than yeah. Donald Trump. And so it was worth, it was more worth the risk after he took office. Yeah. I mean, it, this, is a, this is a recent thing, though. I feel like it, it used to be like Republicans were kind of the pro-immigration party and but but pro orderly legal immigration and the democrats were sort of like no it's the workers the workers i was chatting with my colleague jay nordlinger about this and he's he's he was there for all of this so he remembers it he's like it's just weird <laughs> like we were this was this was our thing and then we've kind of <laughs> we've, we switched but it's um it 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 needs to it, it's just we need to well, first things first you need to stop incentivizing illegal immigration um so stop yep. telling people that, that basically biden should and never will say anybody who comes here illegally will be sent back immediately and there that is you ha if you want to come here you have to play by the rules but the rules have to be coherent and make sense <laughs> mm -hmm. You can't, you can't, you know, seriously, like, there's like so many things where you can accidentally break a rule without even knowing it was a rule. And it's just because there's layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy. So I don't have any bright ideas about how you fix this, but. Well, yeah, okay. and clarity. No, you're you're right. Even on like, you're talking about legal immigration and a lot of the immigrants or the, what are the, a lot of the migrants that come to the border want to come legally. They don't want to break laws. They want to right. hire a lawyer to see if they can qualify for asylum. And if they don't, they'll stay in the u.s um right. and you know as long as you can get across the border legally um and you've already paid cartels up to that point almost no matter what but as long as you can get to the border legally you can work you can hire a lawyer you can have your family and friends in the united states work enough to send you money to hire a lawyer and then you can cross legally um right. and a lot of them want to do that they don't want to break the law because they want to have a shot at staying in the united states but i talked to um all of us to John and, and David, we talked to this young uh, Cuban boy who had fled after the July 11th protests last year. Um, he wasn't protesting. He was looking at the protests and says he was uh, persecuted by the government just for looking. Um, again, hard to verify, but that's what he'd said to yeah. us. And he took the journey and he um, was he, he crossed. A, he paid a coyote to help him cross the river. Um, because he was under the impression that Cubans were uh, exempt from being sent back under Title 42. And that had changed the day before, and it had not been right. made public. And he cr hired a coyote to help him illegally cross the Rio Grande River under the, the impression that he would qualify for asylum under our laws. Our laws are so unclear. Um, you know, the, to qualify for asylum is a, a very difficult thing and it's a very narrow category. Um, so yes, the, the laws themselves need major, major overhauls um, and nobody has the political will to do that at, at all. Um, yeah. and so, it's, because it's thankless because you, you're not going to have Americans lobbying for it you're not going to have them putting pressure on it so why would why would you bother like right voters well, don't care about making it easier to get here the the aforementioned pastor uh, who's running the bible school turned shelter um said he he thought a lot of this started in 2016 when the obama administration changed it so that cubans who touch american soil um that sort of famous conception we all have who literally touch the soil in florida are granted asylum when that happened cubans would go down they realized if they went down through south america they could come up through mexico um mm -hmm. without taking the sort of aquatic route and that kind of created infrastructure 
is basically what he was saying. And it, it taught and showed others that they could take the same route. Um, right. And cartels obviously figured that out too. So it does stem from the law. In, in yeah. all of these cases, it comes from the law. Um, and you know, there, there just there has to be an overhaul, but we all lack the political will to do it. Maddie Kearns, any any final, any closing thoughts as we reflect on this uh, winding, uh, <laughs> sweeping, vast uh, conversation that has taken us through so many twists and turns? Um, at anything that you you feel as though you can you should say as we're wrapping this up and trying to tie a bow on it? Well, if I was looking for a common thread, I would say that laws and policies. And cultural norms should be based on reality. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful thought. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then the common thread is it should be based on reality, but increasingly uh, the, our institutions are captured by a vocal minority that uh, has destroyed the concept of reality and is yeah. moral relativistic and nonsense. What a nice thought to end on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Maddie Kearns of National Review, thank you so much for joining us on High Noon. My pleasure. I'm Emily Jashinsky filling in for Inez Stepman of Independent Women's Forum here on this production of High Noon. I'm Emily Jashinsky, of course, of the Federalist, Federalist Radio Hour, Rising on Hill TV, the National Journalism Center, and a senior fellow at IWF. Inez likes to make fun of me for all of those things that I have to list in one breath um, in introductions and conclusions. I always forget how Inez wraps this up. I forget her parting words of wisdom. I think it's be brave. So I'm just going to go with that. Again, thank you so much for listening to this conversation on High Noon. We'll be back soon with more. But until then, be brave. <laughs>